Dr. Hugh Bradlow, it's good to see you in person. I think last time you were on, now we're talking, uh, was a hologram version of you. Um, we're talking about the fibre future and how it actually will affect people and the importance of it uh, across fields of environment, health, uh, business, uh, education. Uh, let's future gaze and have a look at what it will be and what impact it will have on our everyday lives. Okay, so I, you know, I always start off with the premise that everything has a purpose, and in the particular case of telecommunications, the purpose is to simulate a distant reality locally. So you and I are sitting here talking, um, you know, we've got eye contact, we're sensing body language, we've got a whole perception of each other. We could even do touch, but I won't, but uh, we could do touch, we, um, hopefully not smell, but, you know, taste, those sorts of things. So really, at the end of the day, what we want from telecommunications is we want to be able to recreate a distance exper experience with the reality of a local experience. And if you start thinking of it in those terms, you can start to see all sorts of things where the actual physical reality of tra travel is too much. Um, so, you know, I, I um, always try and draw these examples from people I know. My brother's a physician in England. Um, he was telling me about a case the other day where um, he was called in, or someone in the hospital was called about a patient during the weekend, and the specialist on call for that particular um, problem was not available um, or couldn't get into the hospital because that person would have had to travel um, to get in the hospital, there's the, the time to get there, there's you know getting out of your home, all that sort of thing. If they could have actually brought that patient to the person there would have been a whole different health outcome because that doctor would have been able to look at the patient and see the pallor and those sorts of things, would have been able to pull up the x-rays, would have been able to pull up the path reports, all from home if they had had the appropriate broadband access systems. So my brother can actually pull up x-rays now, but it's like watching grass growing. Um, yeah. And he wants to be able to click up an x-ray and say, okay, that's the current state of the patient. Then he wants to be able to delve into the database and say, has the next x-ray. So he wants to flip through x-rays as though he's standing in the room going flip, flip, flip. If you had the broadband sort of uh, capability, you'd be able to do that. And therefore, it would change the way, the nature of our healthcare systems entirely. Because instead of actually taking people, i.e. doctors or patients into hospitals, um, you'd be able to dis keep them distributed either at local healthcare centers or in their own homes. And the savings from that and the healthcare outcomes, there have been numerous studies which, which prove that. So let's go talk about maybe uh, education now and the sort of changes and, and what, what's the sort of virtual classroom that we're talking about uh, in 10, 20 years from now? Well, I think, you know, um, the virtual classroom is a really holograms, yes, possibly, um, uh, but more likely it's really a telepresence environment. So you've got a group of students sitting in a classroom. The lecturer is remote uh, because, again, you can use the same person, the same specialist teacher to teach multiple classes in different locations. That lecturer is going to be remote from the class but still has excellent visuals with the class and can pick up all the cues that kid in the back stop, you know, talking and this sort of thing. Um, and you can at the same time bring the lecturer or the teacher to the classroom in a way that's sufficiently realistic that the kids actually feel that that person is with them. And then, of course, you can start doing things like doing multinational classrooms um, and combining, uh, you know, classrooms from England with America, with um, Australia or Japan or wherever. In fact, the biggest inhibitor is going to be time zones. So we're much more likely to have classes combined with Japan, China, Indonesia than we are with England or the USA. Um, but and have really good visual contact, high definition visual, 3D contact between those kids so that they really do have that sense of being together. One of the things that's interests me because I do have a background as a university lecturer is that the university model today is a highly vertically integrated model and so you have lecturers in the same course reproducing the same courseware all over the world and you would now have a the potential where you know the um, you could get an Oxford degree from your home in Melbourne, um, and so what does that mean for the local universities? Will students leave them in droves and go to Oxford um, on a, a virtual basis, or do, do you still have that campus environment which is so important to to the universities today? These are questions that they're going to have to confront as they go forward. Yeah, what would it mean for the uni bar? Uh, the, uni <laughs> <laughs> the uni bar, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> the local pub, I think, has to substitute. <laughs> So, okay. And we can't fax drinks yet. Oh, <laughs> that would be the breakthrough. Yeah. Um, obviously, now let's talk about business. I mean, this is where we will probably see a major 
shift in the way business operates and opportunities, not only just locally but internationally. Mm -hmm. so, so what are we talking about in the business world in 10, 20 years with an FTTM future? Well, I think, I, I think one of the things with the business world um, that we're going to see over the next five years um, is that there's going to be immense pressure on greenhouse, you know, emissions, greenhouse. Now, um, the, with one of the things is that you can't, with the greenhouse thing, is you can't actually substitute, you've just got to stop emitting carbon. So there has, there's going to be huge pressure on avoidance of travel, um, and that means that systems like telepresence are going to have a profound impact. I think this whole issue of how you, you know, get telepresence everywhere, telepresence is today a very expensive setup in room like telepresence in five to ten years time is every home has one. Um, you yeah. can telepresence yourself everywhere and then you start thinking about not necessarily holograms because the setup we used in the TE and G demonstration was, is quite complex and very specialized but you think of 3D TV which we're already demonstrating down at the experience uh, center in Collins Street that becomes much more commonplace because the technology is there. People are selling 3D TV sets today. You can now start doing 3D representations of people um, in face-to-face -face meetings and the, the reality keeps on improving. So this notion that you actually have to physically move to go and see yeah. someone is changed dramatically. One of the things is that I observed is if you don't assume that this is a, a vital part of where we're going in the future, then you, you'd be the sort of person who'd say, who would have said 30 years ago the black and white TV is perfectly fine and no one needs color. Yeah, no one would have a color TV today unless they were forced into it by some circumstance. The, the world is going to keep moving on um, just as it did from black and white to color, from um, standard definition to high definition, from high definition to 3D. It, it's just going to keep progressing and you've got to be part of that ongoing development or else you become a backwater. I guess some people in, in this debate, people are saying, look, high-speed broadband, fibre, it's a billions of dollars being spent by the government and the private sector. Really, it's only for the internet. Is that going to be the case in 10, 20 years from now? It's certainly not only for the internet. Even the, the, the network that we're conceiving is not only for the internet. The internet is just a generalised best effort access to all sorts of information and that includes video and things like that. What we're building is actually a, an inf information infrastructure. So it has capabilities like quality of service which mean that I can deliver video to you with, um, with enough certainty that uh, you're not going to lose it uh, because the network's getting congested. And it's not a best effort service, it's actually an information infrastructure that delivers to set levels and set expectations, and that's what you need in order to run an economy. You know, in my mind, there are two big pressures that we're facing um, as a, a community going forward. The one is the greenhouse one, the other is health, the healthcare. We're an aging population, um, and uh, the opportunity to instrument people is enormous. So you've talked about instrumenting the house, the fridge, those types of things. By the way, I went. We, we did an internet fridge in 1997, and I've gone cold on the idea <laughs> of the, uh, for various reasons. But certainly, the, the opportunity to instrument people, um, to put sensors on you, and I've already been to companies who are talking about band-aid sensors. So you've got a heart problem, you put a band-aid on yourself. That band-aid is actually a heart rate monitor and it transmits with a, a, a low power. Uh, low bit rate radio to your mobile, your mobile then is, a, is like a staging point and sends it upstream through the next G network to the doctor's um, surgery and they can, you know, have automated software that's tracking all their patients and says, oh, um, his heart's out of kilter, we'd better get him on the phone and get him in or do some diagnosis. So this whole notion of instrumenting the home is become, going to become critical for energy management and for instrumenting the people inside it to improve healthcare. Well, thank you very much for joining us. It shows and demonstrates how important this is and how vital it is for the, for the coming years. Thank you very much for joining us on Now We're Talking TV. Pleasure, Jeremy. Thanks a lot.